At Popular Science, we report and write dozens of science and tech stories every week. And while most of the stuff we stumble across makes it into our articles, we also find plenty of weird facts that we just keep around the office. So we figured, why not share those with you? Welcome to The Weirdest Thing I Learned This Week from the editors of Popular Science. I'm Rachel Feltman. I'm Jess Bodie. And I'm Charlie McDonald. Charlie, welcome to the show. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome. That intro really makes me feel like I'm on the squad. That was that was so fun. <laughs> you are on the squad. Come on. Absolutely. Um, Charlie, thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, listeners, I probably can't talk about like all the stuff I know Charlie for without like really dating myself and um, <laughs> hearkening back to just like a very different uh time in in my life and my my fandom participation but charlie why don't you tell me about all the cool stuff you're doing now (laughs) i love the if the idea that you like watching me like early youtube era like dates you like what does that say about how old i am (laughs) (laughs) we are contemporaries and unfortunately Mm -hmm. on the internet that makes us ancient so yes yeah (laughs) Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I have been doing internet stuff for a very long time, did uh, YouTube for a, a very long time, over 12 years, uh, took a break, came back more recently. These days, I do a lot of Twitch streams and things like that. Uh, yeah, making YouTube videos too and do some some screenwriting stuff as well. Uh, but I feel like, yeah, most people these days will probably still know me from the uh, the ancient YouTube before times where I was known <laughs> as Charlie and So Cool Like. Um, that is me. Amazing. Well, we're super psyched to have you on uh, sharing some some weird stuff. And uh, Jess, happy as always to drag you over to this side of the soundboard. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm back, baby. <laughs> you never <laughs> left, literally. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. I'm always lurking. Uh, so let's get into it. On the weirdest thing I learned this week, we start by each offering up a little tease about some kind of fact or story that we found in the course of reading, writing, reporting, streaming, etc., and decide which one we just absolutely have to hear more about first. Then, once we've all had time to spin our little science yarns, we reconvene and decide what the weirdest thing we learned this week actually was. Except not really. I decided we don't pick winners anymore, (laughs) and it's fine. (laughs) We all win. win. Uh, Jess, what's your tease? My tease is I'm going to talk about quicksand. Why Why was it so popular in movies? Where is it gone? <laughs> and is it real? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Where has it gone? I can't, I can't wait to hear I know. More. It's weird. Uh, Charlie, what's your tease? Oh, okay. My tease is I'm going to talk about um, British people and tea and the funny impact that it has on the uh, UK electrical system. Fascinating. Yo. (laughs) I love it. All right. Um, My tease is that uh, jellyfish can learn from their mistakes, even though they have no brains, which begs the question, what is my excuse? So, (laughs) um, (laughs) where shall we begin? Um, Shall I dive in with jellyfish, perhaps? Please. Wonderful. Please. Um, While I was researching this fact, I kept thinking of this quote, and I thought it was from um, Lebanese Snicket's book of weird, macabre little quotes, but then it turned out to actually be from Welcome to Night Vale, uh, which mm. I, I think is uh, there, there's a, a fair intersection of topic there. But uh, anyway, it is, there is a thin semantic line separating weird and beautiful, and that line is covered in jellyfish. Um, love that. Very true. So just set the mood there. Um, but before we can talk about how jellyfish learn, we have to talk about the fact that they have no brains. Absolutely none. Head empty. Not even a head, but if they had one, it would be <laughs> empty. Um, and if you're thinking of like the human brain as the archetype of the brain as a concept, um, you're probably not surprised to hear that jellyfish have brains. It would look pretty freaky if they did. And that's something that I'm thinking about now. Um, that is something I very much like. want to see a picture of now yeah, as well. That right. sounds like a freaky image I, I want to see for sure. Yeah, that would be... It'd a, be very alien. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it feels like a great like B horror movie uh, sort of alien creature would be just like a jellyfish with a 
a braid wobbling around in there. Um, Makes me think of Metroid. Mm. Yes. Yeah, 100%. It's like, that's like what it would look like yeah. if it was a jellyfish with a brain. Yeah. Um, but in fact, a brain is really just a cluster of nerve cells that control the body they're in. Um, and exactly what that cluster looks like can vary a lot, especially among invertebrates, most of which have brains, um, but like very small, simple ones. Um, they're often very simple structures that are just called ganglia, uh, but most animals have some kind of centralized nerve structure, aka brain, um, even if it's like, you know, uh, a leech, which like has like one cluster of nerves in their front and then another one in their butts and that's those are brains what? you know butt um, brain yeah yeah so like when somebody talks about like a tentacle or a tail having a brain in it that's what they mean as a kid i always was like you telling me <laughs> you telling me they got they got a brain just stuck on that tail and but what what that refers to is you know a a cluster of nerve cells such that it can be a command center of stuff um and so, yeah, that can look all different ways. It can be in multiple parts of the body. It does not have to be in the noggin. Um, some animals don't have noggins. Some animals are just tubes. But anyway, <laughs> um, jellyfish are some of the only animals that lack this structure entirely. Um, others include sea cucumbers, sea urchins, coral, and, you know, like other marine creatures that are known for, like, their deep intellectual pursuits. Uh, basically... These are very simple, chill guys, and it's maybe not so shocking that um, they have not even the simplest version of what we could call a brain. Jellyfish actually have two nervous systems uh, instead of a central nervous system. Um, so they have a large sort of like net of nerves that controls their swimming, and then they have a smaller nerve net that takes care of feeding, um, a spasm response, which is basically like curling up into a ball if if it happens. Um, and literally everything else a jellyfish might be want to do that smaller nerve net handles. And that's super interesting, not just because like, wow, animals in all of their magnificent forms, some of them don't even have nerves that cluster together the way they're supposed to, but also because jellyfish and their close relatives are some of the oldest sort of animal lineages. They date back 500 million years. So a lot of the best studies we have on like the evolutionary family tree suggest that jellyfish and other, you know, squishy brainless <laughs> things from the sea um, may represent kind of like one of the oldest forks coming off of the ancient ancestor from which all multicellular things uh, came. So we love looking at them because um, other than being kind of freaky and beautiful and weird, uh, also there's this idea that maybe they hint at like what the like, you know, er nerve cell situation was. Mm -hmm. um, obviously things change a lot in 500 million years. It's not like, oh, what's going on in the jellyfish must be uh, just like what our common ancestor had, but it's a good sort of case study in like working backwards <laughs> and then trying to mm -hmm. figure that out. And yeah, I saw one researcher, Rebecca Helm, who works at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, um, which is a, a place where most of the exciting marine stuff happens. Uh, she said that jellies are like the original computer networks with little servers all along the margin of their body that they use cooperatively which I thought was a really nice way of explaining it. So they have yeah. this, yeah, they have this net of cooperative nerve bundles that all talk to each other. And they have like some pockets of centralized nerves, but there's no master controller. So that's a really good thing if, say, a sea turtle comes along and like bites off part of the bell, sure. <laughs> which is like, you know, the body of the jellyfish. Um, because... The, the, there's no way for um, a predator to take a, a chunk out of uh, the brain because there's no brain. Right. It's all just nerve slurry. <laughs> so, hmm. And goo. Um, yeah. yeah, you can really, you can get a real chunk taken off of the main part of you and um, you've just lost a few of your servers and the other ones <laughs> can <laughs> pick up the slack. But we already know that despite this 
relatively bizarre nervous system situation. Some jellies have managed really complex behavior, relatively speaking, given like their total brainlessness. So box jellies, for example, are known to have a pretty complicated courtship ritual. <laughs> they, uh, the females have to catch the males in their tentacles and then eat sperm packets that the males spit up. No! So there's such coordination. <laughs> there's coordination. There's forethought. I mean, maybe forethought's too strong of a word, mm-hmm. but like plans have to be executed, you know? Mm-hmm. Um and some studies even suggest that jellyfish require sleep, which is kind of a an open philosophical question. We've talked about the mysteries of sleep on Weirdest Thing before. Nobody really knows what it's for. But our best guess is that it's like a cleaning or rebooting mechanism for the brain. Um, but when researchers are studying sleep because it's so poorly understood, it's one of those things where it's like one of the questions for them to ask is like, what is the the lowest common denominator of sleep like what what is the core of like what we mean when we say something is sleeping mm-hmm. and uh how many aspects of it that we think are crucial to sleep like can be stripped away and it's still like the same fundamental mechanism happening um well you so need a pillow re- and you need <laughs> yeah. a duvet yeah. and if if the jellyfish don't have those and they're not sleeping right <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> Um, so the researchers knew that the jellyfish had some like circadian rhythm patterns and they were really interested in seeing like, can we demonstrate that they are snoozing in a way that we can comprehend? And a study said, we think yes. And some other people were like, we think no, but it's ongoing. Um, point being like jellyfish, they've got a lot going on in there, (laughs) which is surprising. And um, in this new study, researchers showed that the Caribbean box jellyfish can actually learn from experience with no brain required. So when we say learning, (laughs) there's basically two types of learning that um, become really important when you're talking about like animal cognition studies, because um, you can show that an animal can do one kind of learning and not necessarily show that they can do the other. Um, so non-associative learning is stuff like habituation. So it's like if you poke an animal a few times, it'll eventually stop like shying away because it's like I've learned that you poking me is not going to lead to you hurting me. And associative learning um, is much more complicated because that means an animal has to like connect different cues in its environment. Pavlov's dog is a classic example of that because the dog connects bell to feeding um, and starts salivating at the sound of the bell. So yeah, non-associative learning is just either responding to something more or less. Uh, If you're responding to it more, it's called sensitization. Um, You know, in humans, if you like hear the same sound over and over, you might tune it out uh, or you might be like, I can't ignore that sound (laughs) because it is everywhere and it's happening all the time. Um, But that's, you know, not really what we talk about when we say humans have learned something. And that's important because scientists have known for a while that animals um, in the phylum that includes jellyfish and sea anemones and corals, anemones, (laughs) always gets me, Um, (laughs) they can do things like sensitization and habituation. They can respond to stimulus. Um, So that it's not that it's no big deal. It's still like it, you know, it shows that there's like uh, somebody's home in there, uh, as it were, but it's not what we would call learning, or at least, you know, it's it's a much more rudimentary kind of learning. And um, not many experiments have tried to demonstrate associative learning um, in really simple animals. And some researchers say a lot of that is like um, due to sort of bias in in you know, in that scientists assume that these animals aren't going to be capable of it. And then also just sort of the difficulty of creating an experimental protocol. Um, I saw multiple articles where researchers used the uh, the comparison that like you, you can't judge a fish based on its ability to climb a tree. Right. Which is also <laughs> also something that my friend who's really into unschooling says a lot. So, yeah, <laughs> but um, it's true. For people and for animals. So like researchers uh, in one study, I want to say this was on sponges, but it was definitely on one of one of those simple um, ocean critters. And they were trying to get it to learn stuff 
um, basically using like electrical stimuli, like giving them a little shock to try to teach them to avoid the shock um, and like adding some additional information in there so that it would be more complex than just the more fundamental learning I talked about earlier. But they were like, shocks aren't something they encounter naturally in the ocean. So it's like maybe not fair <laughs> to judge their ability to learn based on their ability to uh, learn from a shock. So all that is to say, it's really hard. And luckily, these researchers decided they were going to try to make it happen with the Caribbean box jellyfish, which is the size of a fingernail. Adorable. Wait, um, that's how big a has- box jellyfish is? There are different kinds of box oh. jellyfish. Was, You're thinking of, yeah. I was <laughs> like, I thought they were large and in charge, but is that the Australian yeah. one I'm thinking of? I There are definitely large and in charge box okay. jellyfish species, But this is a tiny one. And they one. are known for being very poisonous, which I think this box jellyfish also has some potency, sure. but it's so tiny. Okay, yeah, the little babies. of a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they do have 24 eyes. What? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> no way. Again, uh, not, they don't look like our eyes, which again would be so freaky. That would be so I would so love scary, to see dude. it. <laughs> but um, they have visual sensors um, that are arranged in clusters around their body, and that helps them perceive the world. And they have, uh, they seem to perceive the world with a, a really impressive amount of visual detail because they live in these underwater mangrove roots in uh, the Caribbean Sea cool. and um, the central Indo-Pacific region. And it's very murky. And mm. they have to, like, dart around these roots and, like, you know, hunt and not be hunted within these murky roots. And so researchers are like, okay, so clearly with these 24 eyes, <laughs> yeah. they are accomplishing some pretty impressive um sensory and cognitive stuff so let's see if we can show that they learn from visual stimulus because their hypothesis was basically we don't think it would be feasible for them to navigate these waters unless they like learned how to respond to different visual stimuli that they you know encounter in these these murky mangroves And so they designed an experiment um, that also they again, they were trying to make this like using skills that would make sense for this jellyfish to have and to use for learning. So they know that these jellyfish have an instinct to protect their bell because it's like the, the bulk of them. And they also know that they navigate these really cloudy, murky waters. Um, So they put them in tanks that they painted with three different levels of contrast. Some had these like very high contrast black and white vertical stripes, um, which they meant to represent like tree roots in the distance. Um, There was a medium contrast, which was gray and white stripes. And so that they wanted it to be like an optical illusion of tree roots that were like actually very far away or like not actually tree roots. And then they had a solid gray, just no contrast, full murk. And in the tank with the black and white stripes, no problem. They never bumped into the walls. They didn't need to learn anything. They could see that there were some tree roots there, um, so to speak. Um, in the gray tank, they bumped into the walls willy-nilly and they learned nothing. <laughs> they were just like, <laughs> what the heck is up with this wall that I keep hitting into? Um, but... In the tank with the gray and white stripes, um, they gradually learn to associate the decor with a risk of collisions. They started out bumping into the tank walls, um, and these trials were like seven and a half minutes long. Um, and by the end of the trial, they were successfully not bumping into the wall. Um, and <laughs> they said they were like really impressed that it only took three to five bumps for the jellyfish <laughs> to be like, okay, yeah, no, staying away from that is those. impressive. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I'm and now just like imagining a bunch of researchers just like around these tanks. Yeah, just like, yeah you go jellyfish. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. You know it. Um, so the researchers then took this a step further. Um, they wanted to look closer at the, those centers of vision um, that make up 24 eyes. These are uh, known as uh, ropalia, and there are four of them, and each one contains visual neurons and six eyes, uh, air quotes. Uh, So, you know, that's how you get your 24 eyes. Um, And so basically they took some ropalia from the jellyfish and put them in a Petri dish. 
and they gave the cells um, a little electrical pulse, um, which was supposed to be a stand-in for um, the jellyfish bumping into uh, a mangrove root. Um, And while they did this, they were exposing them to images of a moving gray bar Mm. (laughs) to, like, represent that you're approaching this mangrove root and then like zap you have hit it right um <laughs> which is we're, we're all just electrical meat yeah um <laughs> <laughs> so at, for, when they just did the like here approaches a mangrove root nothing happened but when they added in the electrical shock the um ropalium started to generate high frequency electrical signals um the kind that would promote obstacle dodging Mm. in a jellyfish. Um, So this was suggesting that this structure, which like serves as like a little little miniature, like visual brain processing center, um, might also serve as a learning center because you're you're getting this feedback and um, the nerves are just doing it for themselves. Yeah. So obviously there's a lot more work to do to really understand what's going on in a jellyfish non-brain. Um, but it's a great reminder that intelligence can be so different from uh, how we experience it and even how we observe it in animals that are similar to us. Um, and the researchers involved in this study are really excited because they think that this implies that individual nerve cells can learn. Um, so, you know, maybe when we're talking about muscle memory, we're we're talking about nerves learning yo Um, that's interesting yeah and it definitely reminded me of um that time a couple years ago when um some researchers put brain cells in a dish and taught them to play pong oh yeah (laughs) i forgot about that so um maybe even without our brains we could learn from our mistakes and learn how to play pong and isn't that <laughs> thrilling? Poetic for us. Didn't they do something with slime molds once? Like, didn't they teach them how to fear or something? I so slime molds. I almost looked up stuff about slime molds to add to this yeah. because you're right. It's so it feels so similar. Um, slime molds are able to like find their way around obstacles right. and like remember places they don't want to go. That's right. That's like what if I'm you put something of. nasty there, they'll be like. We we have sung of this for generations of slime molds, and we dare not go to this place. Yeah, that's how I imagine it works. Totally, because um, they're so weird. They're like single cells, but like one thing, right? Yeah, yeah. They're 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 one very smart cell. Yeah. So yeah, I think um, we're. Uh, I'm actually. Uh, I think my next book is gonna be about intelligence. That's right. Um, Heard it, heard it here first. Yo, no, you haven't. I've been working on it for <laughs> a long time. Say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I personally heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I love thinking about just all of the ways that it, brains and nerve cells can be so different from um, the way we think of them as working, and and like when we talk about animal intelligence, when we talk about alien intelligence, it's like we really have to go back and and kind of fix so much bias we've baked in about just like what it even means to learn and to think so yeah if uh (laughs) listeners if you want to keep up on um my project about intelligence and whatever it might become you can now follow me on patreon huge hell yeah check me out there you'll find me just by searching my name (laughs) so easy (laughs) that's the secret. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Plug done. Nice. All right. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back with more facts. Okay, we're back. And um, Jess, why don't you draw us in? Oh, and hold us there. That was nice. Uh, that was, that was great. Stand. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and then we can fall through to the secret, like uh, part of the tomb underneath exactly, the yeah. treasure. Yes. Right. That's how it works. Then that hang out there. Be... Finish the episode there. <laughs> yes, that has to be in some Zelda game or something, isn't it? I feel like it. It must be. Um, but yeah. So speaking of the quicksand being in Zelda, it used to be everywhere, right? Like. It was every 10-year-old's worst fear in the 90s. Like, you know, you're just living life, walking around, and then bam, 
you're sucked into quicksand right like that when i was a kid i had that fear it was definitely more of a thing yeah was, and like was it legends of the hidden temple that made it more of a thing i we'll don't know we'll get there we'll get there okay. um and yeah, and it's not like, you know, like I grew up in suburban Illinois. Like, it's not like I'm in the wilderness encountering <laughs> mud and quicksand. But, um, and you know, there's all the myths and the classic instructions of like, don't move. The more you move, the faster you'll sink. Um, and f- personally for me, I feel like I had this fear because of like the Princess Bride in 1987. Like that, you know, I've talked about Fire Swamp on here before and in that fire swamp there is also the quicksand that just like sucks you right in Uh um and as i was researching quicksand it's also in 1984's never ending story um it's in many of the older mario games but not as much today also apparently it was in at least three episodes of the soap opera days of our lives (laughs) at least three episodes (laughs) um Which is hilarious to me, and I kind of want to go scope those out because it has to be amazing. Um, And that was also in the 80s. So all of these things that I've listed are mostly from the 80s, early 90s. But apparently quicksand, like peak quicksand time was in the 1960s. So this guy, this journalist named Daniel Angber wrote a really, really great piece about all this quicksand stuff for Slate. Um, And I will link to that on popside.com slash weird. But yeah, so basically, he did a lot of research about this. And looking back to the 60s, it's super, super prevalent in movies and media. So it is in Lawrence of Arabia, that 1962 award winning movie. My one of my dad's favorites. I think it's a very dad movie. Yeah, classic classic Mm -hmm. dad film. Big time. It's also in this. It's in a lot of movies, but I found this really cool movie I need to go see now from 1964. It's a Japanese sci-fi movie called Woman in the Dunes. Ooh. And yeah, I, I need it. Um, and apparently characters spend, as the name might suggest, a lot of time trapped in a sand pit. Um, but yeah, there are a lot more. And the Slate story actually does have data about this. So peak, like I said, peak quicksand time was in the 60s when nearly 3% of films in the era, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but that's one in 35 movies showed someone sinking in mud, sand, or some kind of oozing clay. Um so one on 35, that feels significant. Um, and basically compare that with every decade before um, or since really, like that's when quicksand was at its peak. So before that, it was like half a percent of films had anything quicksand. Um, so what's, you know, what's with the explosion? And even after that, it kind of peters off. Like I think a lot of our experience with quicksand was kind of like that residual from the peak quicksand. Because ever since then, it's been on a slope towards, you know, now, which you barely ever see it anymore. Well, I think it became such a such a like trope and a cliche. Yeah, it's interesting because like and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but like, you know, other things remain like people still use Wilhelm screams. True. And other gimmicks. I don't know. But I agree. It feels... I was thinking about the Wilhelm scream recently. Do you both know the um, the scream that um, Lego Yoda does yeah. uh, in the <laughs> Lego games? I was thinking we need to get rid of the Wilhelm scream. I think it's tired and it's done. And we need to bring that like uh, that Please. Yoda scream in Please. instead. <laughs> yeah. And start a petition for this or something. I know it because there are all those videos Change. on YouTube. Org that are like <laughs> change work, that are like an hour of silence interrupted by blank and i've seen yes. the hour of silence interrupted by lego yoda screams <laughs> <laughs> it's iconic it's a good scream look at that it's great it's great <laughs> we will link to it on pops.com slash weird so yeah it, it is kind of a trend and like it does feel dated and something that I think of, like, you know, as we consider this transition from quicksand to no quicksand in movies is um, this this one scene that really feels quicksandy, but isn't to me. And it to me, in my mind, it like acts as this transition out of using quicksand as a tool. And that's the trash compactor scene in Star Wars. Yeah. So instead of like being sucked down vertically, they're kind of being crushed horizontally. Um, but it's it has like all the same elements like they're trapped they need to get out you know that sort of thing it's just a lot kind of, of scrabbling a lot of scrabbling yeah <laughs> that's a great word <laughs> <laughs> very similar plot device and you know in star wars there's like the sarlacc pit and yoda's swamp and those are kind of quick sandy too but you know the data does show as more time progresses less quicksand shows up in movie tv and media like consider the tv show lost over a hundred episodes, no quicksand. 
<laughs> no quicksand and loss. So much sand, none of it quick. Correct. Yeah, just wild. Um, that is what would have saved the the ending of Lost if that's they'd what all they just fallen into quicksand <laughs> at the end. Everyone would have been like, "Great, you did it, nailed it." <laughs> <laughs> Best show ever. So why why does quicksand go away? Uh, you know, like I said earlier, the Wilhelm scream is still around. Like the time bomb thing is still around too. Like the snipping of the wires, you know, like gimmicks like that. They're still there. When was the last time I saw that? I'm trying to think. It's in an M&M's commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Highly relevant then still, yes. clearly. See, yeah, I would, I would argue, yes. <laughs> um, but so the writer of this Slate story does have a theory about why Quicksand was so hot and then so not. Um, he says that it was it was that way because it was so tightly associated with 60s culture and politics. So apparently there was reportedly some kind of quicksand in Vietnam during the war. Um, I don't know what kind or if if that was a real report, but um, a lot of political and historical writers of the time kind of used quicksand as a metaphor to describe the war as a whole. So there are books and articles titled, quote, the quicksand war, war, or like, the making of a quagmire, which like at the time quicksand and quagmires were like kind of considered to be the same thing. They are very different, but yeah, at the time, you know, we didn't have an advanced understanding of such things. But, you know, people like also debated something called the quicksand myth in politics. And, you know, it was basically just like a whole thing in the 60s. People were like so into quicksand as as a narrative device, even in real life, in society and politics and stuff. So, and I guess like the whole quicksand myth thing is like you know if you're not careful you get sucked in and then you get sucked in more and more and it's hard to escape without sacrificing something and like i can see how that would be a useful analogy so that was one thing so like you know quicksand just super ingrained with both with politics in the 60s uh and war but you know what else happened in the 60s the moon landing uh you know and i'm sure you're thinking There's no way this quicksand obsession could extend to the moon. And if you were thinking that, you'd be wrong. (laughs) So I was thinking that. (laughs) Basically, there was a group of scientists led by this one guy, uh, a Cornell astronomer named Thomas Gold and a NASA mathematician named Leonard Roberts. And they were like, they were warning everybody that the surface of the moon might be so torn up by like different kind of space waves and junk and everything out there that the sands might be really loose and powdery and dangerous. So they actually warned the Senate in 1963 saying that they were worried about the moon lander, like sinking into the loose sands on the moon. Like they were literally like there's moon quicksand, like use caution. That's not a real thing by the way, but (laughs) moon dust is like really nasty. For sure. It's very sharp. So it would be really bad if it also was quicksandy, but it would luckily be it's not. <laughs> a nightmare. I know. I remember. I think it was Sarah Chodosh who did a segment on like being allergic to the moon dust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nasty. It's happened. But moon quicksand actually was in a movie. <laughs> after they were so like you know, after they warned the Senate about the moon quicksand, they put like Hollywood put it in a movie, and it is the film Twelve to the Moon, which is from 1960, and an astronaut get sucked right down into the lunar quicksand. So basically we aren't, it isn't isn't really clear whether like we first got obsessed with it in the movies and then everybody kind of started applying it as a metaphor to real life stuff or if like stuff like the war and like real life stuff made us obsessed with quicksand and put it into movies. Um, It seems like kind of a positive feedback loop. You know what I mean? Fueling each other. We may never really know the truth um, behind the origin, but whatever, whatever, you know, Whatever the reason, quicksand was hot in the 60s, and as 60s culture kind of became less trendy, the 70s and 80s took over, quicksand supposedly faded away as a metaphor and a Hollywood storytelling device. So that's probably why it was so hot and then not, in theory. But here's the question. The quicksand that they told stories about in Vietnam and the one shown in movies, is it real? You know, would it act like that? Uh Would it really just suck you all the way down above your head? You know what I mean? Uh, And if you struggle, does it suck you down faster? Like, is there truth to that? Well, I'm happy to report that in 2004, the Mythbusters looked, they took a look, you know. (laughs) Uh, 
So if they you're went to the moon. Yeah, right. Oh, I wish. I wish. <laughs> um, so Adam and Jamie, you know, if you're unfamiliar, those are the pro- professional debunkers. Um, they took on this idea of killer quicksand. You know, can people really get sucked into this sand and water mixture and, you know, like 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 it is in the movies. So they filled this giant container with 20,000 pounds of very, very fine sand. And then they turned it into this like slurry by pumping a bunch of water up like through the bottom. Um, and Adam actually gets in, like sacrificing. I'm sure there was safety measures, but, you know, he, he gets in <laughs> and he starts to sink. But only up to like his chest, his waist and chest, kind of like where his armpits are. And, you know, at the end, they do their classic debrief. And uh, Adam's like, all right, what's our final verdict on the movie style killer quicksand? And Jamie's like, surprised you even have to ask. It's absolutely busted. No such thing. Um, (laughs) Perfect. Perfect. uh, Thank you. (laughs) I didn't even practice. I feel like I'm right there. (laughs) Um, But yeah, you know, if Mythbusters isn't good enough for you, which... Come on, it's Mythbusters. Uh, There was a nature study (laughs) published the next year (laughs) in 2005. You know, not like some random journal. It's the big boy nature journal, whatever. Um, So basically, there was this physicist named Daniel Bonn, and he collected, they called it wild quicksand, (laughs) which I think is a really funny way to put it. But, you know, quicksand occurring naturally. It's from this salt lake in Iran. Um, and they brought it back to his lab in the Netherlands. And basically what he did is he placed um, different kinds of aluminum beads in the quicksand. And he he based that on like the density of like the human body, basically. Um, so like it was a, it, in, in his mind, it was it was an analogy to how a human might sink. Um, and he basically found the same thing as the Mythbusters did, is that a person would uh, only sink up to their armpits. So interesting. They basically debunked like movie style quicksand, you know, the kind that like it like think of the Princess Bride where you take one step and then like shoop, you're 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 down there. But real life quicksand is typically made up of, you know, this particular mixture of sand and clay and salt water. And this particular thing about it is when you apply force to it, it kind of liquefies. So it goes from this like solid earth to this gooey liquid really, really fast. And that that does kind of explain the whole like move more and sink faster myth, um, which which does it you know that that can happen, but it's not like you're going to go all the way down. So it definitely doesn't sound nearly as scary. But wait till you hear this. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> the plot thickens. So to pull your foot out of quicksand at a rate of one centimeter per second would require the same force needed to lift a medium-sized car. Oh. So you're stuck in there. Right, yeah. Mm. Um, and if you're stuck up to your armpits, it's also like the the danger, you know, if you're in wild quicksand, as they say. Because like chest compression. Definitely part of it. But the other part of it is um, hypothermia. Because a lot of oh, like quicksand yeah, is like yeah, in colder yeah, yeah. regions. Um, and depending on the time of year. And then the other scary thing, which actually did happen to somebody, I think, in Alaska, is if you're on a coastline and you're stuck and the tide comes in. I, yeah, it's, it's yeah, that's very bleak. sad. Yeah, very bleak. So to cap all of this off, I just have the story of a guy who got stuck and he does survive. <laughs> but, you know, it, it kind of I'll show you the experience of what it's like to get stuck in wild, earthly quicksand. Um, and this guy actually did write about his experience for Outside Magazine. So I'll link to that too on popsidecom slash weird. But basically, this was in Utah back in 2011. It was a 25-year-old hiker and he got stuck in quicksand. Um, his name was Rob Tazar and he was hiking the Dirty Devil River in southeastern Utah. And he was with some other students from this National Outdoor Leadership School. So basically, they were hiking, they were hiking, they were kind of along this riverbank that they wanted to um, it's kind of like a cliff and then a river and they were trying to like traverse um, trying to find a path like between them basically so they found this like receded coastline he was like I'll go make sure that it's not like submerged in water to make sure we can walk across it and about 15 feet from the water he realized something was up he went to like turn around 90 degrees to talk to the guy who he was with and he just sunk immediately to his knees and the other guy he was with only one of his feet kind of sank in so he he was barely stuck 
Um, and they struggled for like 15 minutes trying to get out. And then they used, um, they had some rope. So they were able to like leverage with some rope and his buddy, his, his friend was able to get free, but his, um, his foot came out and the shoe stayed, which is like such a funny (laughs) image. That feels Hollywood to me. Yeah. Uh Um, so basically now this is what Rob was wrote in outside. So quote. The struggle to get out had moved mud and led to maybe an inch or two of water around me. When I put my hand in the drink, it went numb after maybe 30 seconds. It was so, so it was like, it was cold out. It was apparently it was like 65 degrees and I imagine the water was colder. An hour passed. The sun is kind of going behind the canyon wall. It's getting colder. The temp kept dropping and they weren't able to get him out for 13 hours. Wow. Hypothermia huge concern so you know medics and emergency emergency services came all that stuff they were able to like feed him hot meals from this portable stove so that was huge they ended up eventually trying to use a helicopter to get him out so i know (laughs) just like hoisting wow so basically they had it hover above him and he like was like holding on to something attached to the helicopter and then they tried to like lift him up and so this is what he says quote After the third time, and by the third time, he means like trying to lift him up the third time. uh, I remember telling them it wasn't working. The fourth time, I ended up slipping up a little bit as the helicopter went up and it pulled me in a weird way. I felt my back go pop, 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 pop. (laughs) So he was like, let's please stop. (laughs) Yes. And... The pilot was heard over the radio saying, like, if I try this anymore, I'm going to rip this kid in half. So they ended up getting him out, not with a helicopter, but like rescuers went out on rafts and dug him out with shovels. Um, And that took 45 minutes, but it did eventually work. And the reason it took so long and why it was so difficult, because remember, he's not in that far. Um, It's really really just his legs. Um, But. They had to be really, really careful to like hold the quicksand and the mud in a certain way that it didn't like flow right back in around him. But yeah, they got him out and they flew him to the hospital and he had completely lost feeling in his legs. And then he he wrote this quote, it was Thanksgiving. So I called my parents at 5 a.m. Three days later, my legs regained their feeling and I joined the group for a 10 day backcountry skiing session in the Grand Tetons. Wow. Some people are just... (laughs) Different from me. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. <laughs> so yeah, and like this is not the only quicksand story that's out there. So my final piece of piece of advice for y'all: what to do if you're stuck. And according to the ex- experts, the best way to get out is to do the, a little wiggle, to kind of wiggle your legs around. And th- you know that is antithetical to the movie advice because movie advice exactly is like, that is the one thing I wouldn't want to do. Right. Because that's what the movies have taught me. Exactly. I was surprised it's as like, well. like, don't thrash. <laughs> yeah. Wiggle. Right. So it, gentle. it's gentle wiggles. And that makes kind of like space gentle between wiggles. your legs and the quicksand itself. So if water can flow in there, then it like kind of dilutes and loosens the sand. Um, that's like what the experts say. And you have to do it really slowly and like progressively. And it only really works like until you lose feeling in your legs. Um but in theory, the wiggles should work. So, yeah. And, you know, you're not going to really sink past your, your waist or your armpit. So even though the movies say don't wiggle, you got to wiggle a little bit. Um, and that's my quicksand story. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I feel so much more prepared um, for what feels like my inevitable <laughs> encounter with quicksand I know. now. I know. Though we've talked about mm-hmm. it. I have to admit, I don't think... The movies ever made me afraid of quicksand. Really? I think I maybe came into like movie quicksand around the time where I was like, okay, this is clearly a very goofy, silly thing yeah. and would never actually happen. And I think I maybe just always assumed it was made up for the films. I feel like it hit me at the perfect age where I was like, oh, this is real. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I also think like, you know, <laughs> I definitely remember adults telling me like, oh, yeah. And the thing about quicksand is you can't move when you're like people definitely responded to questions about movie quicksand as if they knew way more than they did, which made it seem like much more of a credible. Right. Threat. Right. 
Maybe just like our TV budgets were worse in the UK and our just like quicksand <laughs> looks like really pathetic and everyone was just like that. <laughs> we would be able to get through that just Maybe. fine. <laughs> yeah, the days of our lives quicksand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back with one more fact. Okay, we're back, and uh, it is it's tea time. Tea time. It is tea time. <laughs> yeah, um, I want to talk about um, tea and yeah, British infrastructure. If that's okay with you both, <laughs> this is um, always one of my um, my favorite facts about um, one of the odd ways that the United Kingdom works. Um, I did want to ask you both: Are you big tea drinkers, either of you? Okay, I have the perfect thing to say about this and it's my favorite thing to brag about <laughs> please so in in undergrad in college I, I studied in London for a whole semester um and I loved it it was the best and mm-hmm. I I did like a little internship at this um nursing magazine called nursing times shout out nursing times and I did a lot of really cool things at that inter- internship and then everyone was lovely but my biggest claim to fame is that you know I learned to make a really good cup of tea Hell and yes you know at like the workplace or at least where i worked like people would do a tea round like where you make tea for everybody Mm. and then you go give it to everybody and that was a whole thing and by the end of the internship one of my coworkers said i can't even tell an american made this tea and that wow wow i know you really (laughs) assimilated that's incredible i did so i like tea. (laughs) if you spent if you spent enough time yeah sorry go on Oh yeah, does I like tea a fair bit, and my husband actually does not like coffee, so he's a he's a tea guy. So we have we have a lot of teas. <laughs> okay, and do you both have electric kettles? Is my question. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But I, I know that like, like is... people people you know say Americans microwave their water a lot. That is a big thing. Yeah, I, I don't know if you've seen, there's this one TikTok of this like American mum and her kid and they're like, here's how you make British tea. And they start off by microwaving water oh, for like no. like 30 seconds and then just like pouring in a ton of milk and it's it's the worst video oh. ever made. Um, but yeah, um, if yeah, just because you spent time in the UK, you would know that that sort of stereotype of like British people drinking an absurd amount of tea is just like a, a very like true to life stereotype. It's so <laughs> true, yeah. And I became I like I I loved it. It's I it was great. Yeah, it's very much just like a, any time that you show up in like a British person's home, it will just be a matter of time before you're offered like a cup of tea. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say that like at least in my experience, like electric kettles are pr- pretty rare or it seems more uncommon for them to show up like in uh, North America Mm -hmm. whereas pretty much just like every single household it would be very surprising to go into a household and not like have them have like an electric kettle one of the things that I discovered when I moved from the United Kingdom to Canada is I got an electric kettle and I was like oh why is my water taking so long to boil Um, because, and I think, I don't know this for sure, because I hadn't actually been able to find anything on this. I'm just sort of going by what um, my understanding is, but because the mains voltage is different in Mm. like North America and in the UK, like the mains um, in North America is like 120 volts, whereas in the UK, it's about twice that. Oh, wow. So my understanding is that the kettles in the UK will just take more power and therefore we'll be able to heat up water just faster. That does make sense because I remember speaking of my study abroad trip, people who like brought their curling irons and flat irons for their hair and then like plugged them in and then they got like short circuited and broken. Huge mistake. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That is very much a thing. Yeah, for sure. Right. Um, but yeah, so um, one of the sort of like things that has, um, there's a certain phenomena in the UK is called TV pickup, which is kind of a combination of the British's, British people's love for tea, um, for having tea very regularly, for associating any kind of break with let's have a cuppa, mm-hmm. um, along with this sort of like reliance on electric kettles um, in combination with particular like big TV events. Um, and so basically, and this is, a, this is a thing that is exclusive to the United Kingdom. This doesn't mm-hmm. happen anywhere else in the world. Um, but anytime that there is like a big like TV event, 
be that like a, a sports like event or it's particularly prevalent when there's like um, a finale of like a soap opera like EastEnders or something like that um, or reality TV is another big one or if it's like a specific thing like um, like uh, you know a royal wedding or something like that sure. all of these things um, bring a lot of people around their TVs and then the Love moment Island. that yeah the moment that like <laughs> hey um <laughs> The moment that a commercial break happens or that particular event ends, every single person is like, okay, it's break time. Now I can go and have my tea. And right. suddenly millions of people across the country are all turning on their kettles at the same time. <laughs> um, and so this is something that there's actually a specific um, team at the national grid, which is the, the name of like the country's like electrical system. Um, they're called the National Grid Energy Balancing Team. And so what they wow. do <laughs> is that they track um, when events like this might happen so that they can um, make sure extra energy is pumped into the grid at these specific moments so that to compensate basically for all of these people mm -hmm. making tea at the same time. It's not it's not just tea, obviously, it's like um, other things associated like with it, like, um, you know, opening your fridge or something like that, all of these sort of like other like electrical things, but it's all happening kind of in sync. Um, the biggest one that ever happened was during the 1990 World Cup after mm. the semi-final. It was England versus West Germany. Um, I don't know how familiar you two are with um, with footy, <laughs> with, with soccer. <laughs> um. uh, yes, my, my husband is actually uh, German and mm, okay. uh, a football fan. So I, I'm i not mm. actually that familiar, mm. but I, I dabble. I stand in the room while it's on. I dabble as I well, am, lightly. Yeah. I'm pretty much exactly the same, but it's like, I think being in England for so long, it's just like impossible not to just pick up knowledge. So it went to penalties, basically. Mm. So this was like, um, because it was a semi-final, they couldn't end it in a draw. Someone had to win. So they went into extra time and it was still a draw and they went into penalty shootout. So basically it was like the match went on as long as it possibly could. Sure. Um, and so there were a lot of people kind of like staying and watching the specific event. Um, and then the moment it ended, there was a 2,800 megawatt demand, which apparently is equivalent to uh, 1.5 uh, million kettles, give or take, oh all, my all going goodness. off at the, at the same time. <laughs> the people were thirsty. Yes. They were so gasping. <laughs> That's um, wild. And I say equivalent to kettles as well, because every time I have I did a, like research into this, anyone from the national grid would like, they would say a number and then they would specifically say, this is how many kettles that is, because that is like their frame of reference, basically. Right. Um, but yeah, there's there's a whole team of people dedicated just I to like- I love that there's a team, yeah. Yeah, they will, they will track like uh, specific TV events, based on like data over the course of like the last five years so they can like have a comparison and be able to make predictions. They will be in direct touch with like TV networks so that they will know like the precise moment that like an episode of EastEnders is like supposed to end so that they can compensate for that. Sometimes they will um, like, uh, I was watching a video where somebody was going through this process and um, he was like, I'm, I'm in touch with like France so I can get some like surplus power from, from them to compensate right. for this moment as well. And I actually have a, a, yeah, a quote here from somebody um, at the um, National Grid Energy Balancing Team um, who said, the TV pickup from deal or no deal is gobsmackingly high. How sad is that? Oh <laughs> so <God. laughs> not only are they like forced to watch all of these like shows and pay attention to all of these events, but apparently <laughs> they don't even necessarily like doing it, which is yeah. extra funny to me. That, I agree. That's hilarious. Also, sidebar, the deal or no deal, I should say, in the UK is very different to how it is in, in North America. Um, oh. It's the same general format, but just like aesthetically, while the one in like, um, uh, yeah, in the US is like all of these like pretty ladies opening all of the boxes. Totally. Um, in the UK, it's all just regular like members of the public who will eventually go really? on to like be a contestant. That's more fun, yeah. I think. I, yeah, I think so totally. as well. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it's very sad to whoever that um, quote is from, from the, the National Grid. I like yeah. Deal or No Deal a lot. Yeah. Um, personally, <laughs> yeah. The other thing I discovered as I was doing research into this is um, the specific infrastructure that exists to make sure that they can 
um, provide energy during these surges. Um, and they have basically these like um, reservoirs of water and they will kind of like slowly over time pump reservoir, pr pump these reservoirs with water so that they have this big supply of water. And then the moment that they need all of this energy because everyone's standing on the kettles, they will open up a valve, all of this water will come down and they'll generate a bunch of like um, hydroelectricity in that huh. moment. And that is how they will compensate for these <laughs> um, these huge spikes. That's wild. I wonder why they, may, may, I don't know, I wonder why they choose that. that. Maybe that's just like what was easiest to do. And I also wonder like, the first time they realized this was happening, like, I wonder, like, did the grid go down? You know what I mean? Like, how, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't have any specific information on when they were, when this first started occurring yeah. or anything like that. Um, just that it is just a very regular occurrence now um, in the UK. Although it is slightly less, re uh, like, regular now, um, or at least these spikes are less big than they used to be. Sure. And that started first with, um, when the UK went from like five terrestrial channels to like digital TV, when suddenly there were just like a bunch of other channels to watch. And then <laughs> again, sort of add to that with like streaming and things like that. Yeah. There are less of these moments that occur now where, where just like a lot of people are all watching like a specific uh, show or event or something like that. Um, and it is worst uh, for sporting events. That apparently is the bad, the bad one because that's the one where they don't know when it is going to end or when the thing right. is going to happen. Yeah. At least when they're in that. touch with like, yeah, like it's the finale of Love Island or whatever. They like they yeah. know to the to the like the dot exactly when that thing is going to end. But um, tennis is apparently a particularly bad one because those matches can just go on for <laughs> yeah. a very very long time and they just have to sit and wait and just be ready for that moment. And just be ready and with that giant tank of water. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was really curious though, like how how do you provide that energy all in one go? And totally. I, like, I guess you just like have a battery with a bunch of energy stored in it, but right. at the same time, a res what is a reservoir of water other than a bunch of energy stored in one place and the moment you open that valve, suddenly you get that energy, right? I guess it's sort of yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. And I would love to watch a like split screen of whatever event I'm watching yes. and them <laughs> being ready to release, like, release the, kraken. the kraken. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> oh, Incredible! Are Incredible! Into one. It's true. It's true. It's a, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 I can 100% send you the video that I watched, uh, which was from. Uh, it was a clip from an episode of a TV show. I want to say it was called um, like above Britain or something. Mm. Um, and there is a clip of somebody who is like, I don't know where I'm gonna get my energy like from in this moment. Like the BBC told me EastEnders is, was gonna end by now, um, but it's still <gasps> on the air. And then just like watching this like man just like have this like intense focus and panic while <gasps> hearing like the ending credits music to EastEnders <laughs> as he's trying to just like scramble to make sure he's gonna like have all his power. And he's just like, where's the energy from France? It's just like, do 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 it's pretty it's pretty awesome. so i should send that to you if you want to link please to it. yeah i definitely want to see that yeah um <laughs> wow i love that so much and it makes me kind of um it there's something kind of sad about it no longer being a thing that mm -hmm. everybody is I know. watching uh these big events happen at the same time even though like you know it's not that i think that the uk should have been forced to just stick with the five BBC channels for forever mm -hmm. and never get digital TV. But we should do more uh, synchronized experiences, I think, are... That's probably why people like Twitch. Hey, there you go. Speaking of, I think hey. it's the reason that it seemed from what I can I can see, it's like either like, yeah, royal wedding events mm -hmm. or sports events is the big one. Sports events is the one that I think people are still going to be watching, watching live. And no matter what yeah. the service is, you know, you're still going to want to see that. Yeah. In the US, we really just have the Super Bowl. I can't think of anything oh, yeah. else. <laughs> um. I guess the ball drop. Yeah, people in the UK are still really uh, into football. And so, yeah, big, big football events are still going to be the, the big one for sure. Yeah, it's never going away. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I love what a range of weird stuff we had today. Truly. 
um, <laughs> such an assortment. Charlie, thank you so much for coming on. It was so great to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being a great venue for me to share my sort of nerdy British tea infrastructure fact. <laughs> it's one of my favorite favorite facts. I was trying to rack my brain for what to what to share, and I was like, oh it's yeah, perfect. TV pickup. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely like <that>. sure. perfect. <laughs> And um, would you remind our listeners uh, where they can find you? Sure. Um, yeah, the best sort of places on the internet to find me are either on YouTube. Um, I'm just youtube.com forward slash Charlie. Uh, someone at YouTube was nice enough to give me that redirect a long time ago. Nice. That's amazing. Um, uh, and then I also do uh, a lot of streams on Twitch too. Um, probably more um, prominent on Twitch these days. Um, and that's twitch.tv forward slash cool like. Yeah. Awesome. The Weirdest Thing I Learned This Week is produced by all of our hosts, including me, Rachel Faltman, along with Jess Bodie, who also serves as our audio engineer and editor extraordinaire. Our theme music is by Billy Cadden. Our logo is by Katie Belloff. If you have questions, suggestions, or weird stories to share, tweet us at weirdest underscore thing. Thanks for listening, weirdos. 